Hotep, everybody. This is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network and host of the African History Network show. It is Sunday, March 31st, 2024. It's Resurrection Sunday for some of you, but we're still here with our brother, Professor Manu and Pim. Hotep, brother, how you doing today? Hotel brother Michael, I'm, I'm holding it down here on the West Coast, my brother. All right, he's on the West Coast, and we have a fantastic discussion planned for today. We were originally going to do uh, this interview back in February uh, of 2024, but uh, we weren't able to do it, so we rescheduled it for today. We're going to talk about uh, Professor Manu and Pam's new book, Volume Two of A History of African Civilizations. He has a special section in there dealing with the great Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who's known as the father of Black history, father of Black History Month, but there's not a lot of information really about Dr. Woodson and his research on African history and African culture. Professor Manu and Pam is going to talk about that today, as well as as a topic that Professor Manu and Pim talks about all the time, which is the need for primary research, the need for primary research, okay? Now, if you're not familiar with Professor Manu and Pim, he's a historian and primary or firsthand researcher specializing in African and African-American history and culture. He's currently a tenured professor of history and, Afri and Africana studies and the chair of the history anthropology and geography department at Contra Costa College in San Pablo, California. He is also the director of Advancing the Research, uh, which is in Oakland, California, Advancing the Research, where he created a seven-step primary research methodology home training course. He has a master's of arts degree in history and African American studies from Morgan State University. His master's, his master's thesis, which we've interviewed him about before here on the African History Network show, uh, is the revolutionary Martin Luther King Jr. in 1989, and is being expanded into a two-volume work entitled Martin Luther King, The Evolution of a revolutionary martin luther king the evolution of a revolutionary and i know when i've talked to you in the past uh professor manu uh you talk about how <laughs> dr king is very much misunderstood very much underrated uh, uh etc so um we definitely definitely need that book so so when we talk about um the this uh why don't you give us a synopsis uh, of your book first. Let's start there. Why don't you give us a synopsis, uh, a, a history of uh, African civilization? Well, yeah, I appreciate civilizations. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, you know, the, the book uh, actually is the second revised edition and the history of African civilizations actually grew out of my work at Contra Costa College where I teach a class on African civilizations. It's, it's a unique class because we deal with Africa at the apex of human achievement without right. dealing with the derailment of slavery, colonialism, we don't focus on that. And what I was doing is sharing with my students all of my firsthand research and art articles, essays, slides, but that's not user friendly. So I created right. a reader, but I said, well, why create a reader for the class and not make it also available for the public? So the book grew out of my work on campus and I wanted to make sure that I could spread what I'm teaching in the classroom as wide as possible to the public. So it's based on my 35 years of doing work in dozens of countries on, um, on African civilizations, but I wanted to also make sure it was available to the public. So it actually is a text book, but it also is a, is a, is a book for the community and people can even use it as a layperson because there's actually some lesson plans and, and resources at the end of each chapter. So the book grew out of that. And it's just a small part of what I teach but it's what I teach nevertheless as we go and look at Africa from an inside perspective. And one of the great things, Brother Michael, that I've been focusing on is to make sure that I can attack and, and uh, overturn the widespread information viruses that are out there. People know about computer viruses, they know right. about coronavirus, but there's information viruses, there's widespread misinformation that takes place. So my career has been to tackle and challenge this misinformation by doing the first and original research and making sure that people are not talking about, as they say these days, back in the day. Well, whose day? What day? Professors <laughs> don't think that way. So we challenge this back in the day idea because nobody's held accountable. It's just, well, you know, back in Africa, they used to do this. That's not good enough. So I bring not only the information, but the teaching and research methodology when we go to the sites and sources. So that's what 
the book uh, attempts to to do, and I think we've achieved, you know, making that information and the methodology available to the community. Okay, now uh, I know you're you're big on primary research. I know you teach a a, a class on that as well. Uh, you have it at your website, uh, advancingresearch.org. Um, years ago, when I first interviewed you. Uh, on my blog talk radio show, you talked about the need for primary research. So uh, explain uh, for people who may not, who may not know, who may not really, you know, study history like we do, we dedicate our lives to this, this type of work, explain to people exactly what primary research is and how does that compare to secondary research or tertiary research? Yeah, I appreciate the, the question. Uh, primary research basically means firsthand research. It means when you're going directly to the sources and to the, to the sites or going to the original information and evidence as opposed to going through someone else. So mm -hmm. primary means firsthand research. And uh, so that's what I decided to do so I can have a clear understanding by going to pyramids, temples, tombs, ancient residential sites and living communities as well as museums institutes and libraries going to look at the original artifacts and documents that's what primary research is about whereas secondary is that if i am doing the work out in the field and then share it with someone else then if they're relaying it to to other folks then they would become a secondhand source if mm -hmm. i give a presentation or lecture or seminar then those that receive it now are one level removed from the original information. So it's called secondary. And when that person leaves a seminar or lecture and then shares it with their family or community, then those receiving it in the community now are a third hand source of information or, or what we call tertiary information. And the further information gets away from the source, the more inaccurate it is because people are creative. You can be right. as clear and simple as possible, but when it gets away from the source, the more the information is inaccurate and distorted. So we can't always do all of the firsthand research. So there is a great need for secondhand information or people who are who are out in the field sharing information as widely as possible in their networks. But a, a real scholar is not just relying on that, on what other people have written or what other people have produced but they're going to the sources themselves as well. So this is why primary research is the highest level of uh, research and we can't minimize the significance of it because one thing I learned by looking at the actual documents and mm -hmm. going out in the field myself, it's like, wow, what I had been told versus what I saw and was able to document is usually very, very different. So this is why primary research is important and you know and people always talk about his story right i i agree there's a, there's a concern about him or his story so we've always called it our story but we cannot teach and promote our story accurately unless we're going to the records and the sources and, and it's not easy but it's right. required it's, it's required it if we're going to penetrate uh another level of understanding and learning so that's why i'm so totally dedicated to primary research Right. And it's time consuming and it's, it, it, it's, it costs money, too. It costs money to do research as well. People think it's just free to do all this type. But no, it's not. <laughs> and we don't do this for the money, but it sure as hell takes money to do this. OK. Um, in the beginning, you, you, you mentioned um, misinformation that's out there. And I think you t talked about a history virus or something about a virus. What would you call it? Information virus. Information virus, right? Information yes. virus. So as, uh, so let people know, um, the when people take your your class at um, Contra Costa College, uh, are you teaching freshmen, sophomore, juniors? Are you teaching master's courses? Who, generally speaking, uh, what level are you teaching? Uh, Contra Costa College is a it, it's a community college, so we mm -hmm. you know we have a lot of younger students uh, out of high school, eighteen to twenty two, twenty five, but there's a lot of returning students in their thirties, forties. Yeah, uh, it's pretty common to have grandparents as well, and when mm -hmm. people know that I'm teaching the African Civilizations class, I get community people that will sign up for that course. 
So uh, they may not be a, a large percentage, but there's always older community people just taking that one class. And then we also, as, as I mentioned, we have older people as well. But if you look at the largest group, it would be a group in their uh, teens, 20s, and early 30s. That's the larger group. And, and by the way, it's a cross-section of students. Now, right. uh, I get more students of African descent in my African civilizations class than we would in the U.S. history class and the California history class. But uh, it's a range of students. And, you know, and, and one of the things, too, about if you're effective, and students are not just in the class to get a grade. That means that after the semester, when the grades are turned in and there's no incentive for them to be in touch with you, and when students come back and then they find me on social media, they're not even history majors. They're not even right. African studies majors. They just want to continue to learn. And so that's when you know you're effective because they can say anything during the semester. <laughs> but after the semester, matter of fact, just this past week, one of my former students, he's now a football coach and okay. he, he i was doing a talk on campus and he said that professor i just want you to know that i took your class around 2008 you know by that time you know bodies change and, and facial hair and all that so <laughs> I, didn't recognize him. I didn't recognize him at first and then he gave me his name i said i remember that name and then he sent me an old picture i said i remember mm -hmm. and so brian uh he said that it's because he took my classes that he decided to major in history. And that's been his discipline ever since. But wow. that's what I get on a regular basis. And so you can, you know, we're not in it for accolades. We're definitely not mm -hmm. in it for the money or anything like that. But it always is refreshing when we see students in the community and they tell us different stories about the impact. So that's how I know that it's impacting not only students of African descent, but students across the board because if you're giving insight from a balanced perspective, reasonable people see the value in it. And that's what I've learned over the 18 years that I've been in country Costa. 18? Let's see how many years. Yeah, I've been 18 now. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. the, and I asked that question because I wanted to ask this follow-up question. You know, I interviewed um, uh, Dr. Daryl Scott, who uh, he was a history professor at Howard University. He's now at Morgan State University. He's a friend of mine. And he actually is a former past president of ASALA, Association yeah. for the Study of African American Life and History. So, you know, yeah. Daryl Scott? I definitely do. Okay. So I, I, I interviewed him and he was talking about how um, the freshmen who come to his history class he has to dispel all these myths that they've gotten about history and bad history from YouTube and different things like this. Right. And in a lot of my lectures, I talk about how sometimes I have to spend the first 20 minutes dispelling myths before I can really get into the subject matter, especially if we talk about, you know, Dr. King, the civil rights movement, Malcolm X, different things like this. So I was just wondering, what are some of the popular myths that students come to the to your class with that you have to dispel. <laughs> a lot of times you got to get past these myths before you can even get into the syllabus, before you can get to the real subject matter. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's a great question. One would be to uh, challenge this, as I mentioned before, this idea that mm -hmm. back in the day is a relevant response. It's a not It's not a relevant response. People use that because they don't have the details. Uh, right. So I have to tell them that in a professional setting, historical context means everything. So you have to always answer the questions of when and where and not talk right. about back in the day. Whose day? What do you mean? That's too general. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And then there's other things like in the U.S. history class. I'll start there. There's all kinds of myths. So such as Lincoln, quote unquote, freed the slave. So I blow <laughs> right. that away. And students right. are shocked. They're, they're shocked when we go to the text and the actual sources of what Lincoln wrote and what he said in mm -hmm. his speeches, that he right. had no respect for equality for black people or anything else. So that's mm -hmm. a huge myth that's overturned. And also a big myth is that black people or, or people of African descent first came to the U.S. as enslaved victims. But we're right. not sure that they came as masters of their own fate as mm -hmm. rulers, as great traders and great people of high stature and influence, they're blown away by that because they've never heard it, never seen it, and never thought about it. And, and, and I think another one that stands out is the criminality mm -hmm. of Columbus. Mm -hmm. And that uh, it wasn't until 1992 that he's been, he, he went from being celebrated to now he's been condemned as a common criminal because of his own 
writings and his own conduct. Those are some things that are shocking. And if I look at the African Civilizations course, a big takeaway or big influence that people have, they have no idea of the high level classical African civilizations. They're not aware of ancient Kush. They might have right. heard about a Nubian king or Nubian queen in the popular discussion. You know, people just make that statement. When I show them that that's not just some statement, here mm -hmm. are Nubian people, here are Nubian children, Nubian school, Nubian elders, here's Nubian contributions to humanity. There, and, and I think one other thing in addition to that is the fact that Kemet or Egypt is thoroughly and fundamentally African and it is always been and, and continues to be a part of Africa, both uh, historically, geographically, linguistically, right. culturally. So those are some of the things that come out and stand out on a regular and consistent basis throughout all of my classes. Now, so I want to hit on this, then I, then I want you to talk about Kush. So when you talk about um, Africans came to this land that we call the United States of America, and I make a difference between the land we call the United States of America and the Americas. I'm not talking about South America. You know, we know about Abubakari II in uh, 13, 11, 13, 12 AD, things like that. But you, you, you mentioned specifically the land we call the United States of America. Africans first came here as rulers, not as slaves conquered and shackled by Europeans. Talk about what period of time you're talking about and, and give us some examples uh, of, of, of what you mean by this. Yeah, and I appreciate it. I, I covered this also in my book as well. The book is a survey of these African civilizations. Well, the first period in dealing with the Americas of the Western Hemisphere, I start mm -hmm. there. Okay. And it's to deal with um, a undeniable African presence and influence among the Olmec. Now, yeah. all the Olmec were not African if people look at the images, but to try to deny that Africans were there is folly and has nothing to do with definitive evidence. So the first episode is to look at Africans a little over 3,000 years ago, about 1,200 before the Common Era, and to show uh, that Olmec rulers, there's been 17 heads that have been found thus far since mm -hmm. the late 1850s. So I show the heads that we look at the context of the features because the features of those massive heads that are, some are five tons, 10 tons, 20 tons, 30 yeah. ton heads, you can look at the Africoid appearance. So part of it is, so that's one episode, but it's not just the images, it's to look at the, meta, or the, 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 the hieroglyphic writing system and the rituals and the ceremonies among the Olmec and see similarities as well as the architecture uh, with Africa and see similarities. And I remember uh, talking with uh, the late great Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, mm -hmm. and he's, you know, he had pointed out that if there's an in, if there's contact and influence, it won't just be in one area. But there'll be numerous areas, and that's one of the things that I share with students. That number one, we look at the Olmec influence, and then I even so I, I I share all of these particular details about the Olmec. But then another area is one you actually uh, mentioned because we don't have time to go into all the details in the sure. class. But I do share with them that there are many episodes when Africans came to the Americas. So I, I even showed them and and showed that that Abubakar II in 1312, because people remember like rhymes. I remember that when I was growing up, we never <laughs> forgot when Columbus didn't discover. But when he came to the Americas, they would they would always teach us that in 1492, right. Columbus sailed the ocean blue in the Nina, the Pinta and Santa mm -hmm. Maria. So right. I never forgot 1492. So I always tell students. If that works, then let's do it for Abubakar II. That in 1312, Abubakar II sailed the ocean blue. I say, right. so I'm not telling you, you know, to, to, to put that in your pipe to smoke it. So, but Abubakar came about 180 years before Columbus. The difference is he did not keep a journal. Mm -hmm. So then somebody would say, well, how do we know that the 2000 ships actually made it? Well, we have to look at the currents and uh, the wind, but we also, well, don't even really have to guess because the conquistadors themselves from Balboa to Columbus mm -hmm. and a number of people said they saw Africans when they arrived. Those are the right. ones that introduced and brought slavery. So with, that with, with, the, with gold tip spears too. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no question. And, and, and matter of fact, um, um, in the Darien region of uh, Panama, that's the southernmost area of Panama, Balboa in 1513 clearly said that he saw two black men among mm -hmm. the native people. 
So people say, yeah, but they're just descendants of slaves. That makes no sense because chronologically, Balboa is the first conquistador that brought slavery. But what, but, but what we learn from the records is that Africans in that region were distinct and separate from Native Americans. And it seems as though that they had some differences and conflicts. So they had their own areas. And mm -hmm. this is what, so the conquistadors are not looking for Africans, they're just describing their experiences. So then the question, well, how would conquistadors or Spanish know the difference between Native Americans and Africans? And so, well, that's pretty easy to, to uh, discuss is because the Africans controlled Spain for almost 800 years. They know exactly what Africans were. It's about the Moors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Moors, absolutely. <laughs> And no question whatsoever. whatsoever. So Garci uh, Ordonez de Montavo, he, when he writes his novel in 1510 about the knight Esplandian, he explains that it was Queen Khalifa that ruled over the so-called island of California. They didn't know it wasn't an island. It's just a small strip of land. Mm -hmm. And so well, where would he get this name Khalifa from? Because the Moors, you know, one of the titles, of a Muslim title is the Caliph. Caliph, and the caliph yeah. is, a, is a ruler. So to feminize the word in Spanish, you get from caliph, you get califa. And so this is what was in the mind of the Spanish. And so you got an author who writes about this story of a of a woman controlling so-called California and, and the conquistadors. They took that seriously, like Cortez. He takes that seriously, looking to conquer not only the mighty Aztec and Montezuma II, but also to conquer whoever this Khalifa was. So I, so right. I, anyway, but I, I go into those two areas, the Olmec from 3,000 years ago, and then the West African voyages in the 1300s, and then used the conquistadors who came later and who described the Africans that they saw and heard about from Native Americans to show two very distinct periods of Africans in the Western Hemisphere before the conquistadors, before Columbus, Balboa, and and uh Pizarro and the rest of them to show that they came as independent traders and rulers and not slaves initially yeah and you know the uh one book that i recommend for people is by dr john henry clark christopher columbus and the african holocaust slavery and the rise of european capitalism because this book came out in, in 1992 which was that 500 year commemoration of uh columbus setting sail on his voyages and what a lot of people miss and this is i probably first heard professor kabahai wafa kamenei talk about this he's one of my teachers um uh, columbus set sail late in the same year that the moors lose control of their last stronghold granada january 2nd 1492. so and and when you when you deal with that uh 800 years and and uh a good book and i got it somewhere here in the office uh, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, which you just talked about. That yeah. was one of the books right there that caused me to like really hone in on this history and really understand. Because a lot of people ask the question, okay, you have ancient Kush, you have you know, Nubia, you have uh, you know, Ta-Nehisi, you have ancient Kemet, you have Great Zimbabwe. How do we end up in, in chains? Things like this. Well, you got to look at that 800 year period of those of those Africans, not just in Spain. They first go into that Iberian Peninsula, but go all throughout Europe. And they're taking the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe, which brings Europe out of the Dark Ages. And, 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 I, and I talk about how everything we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. OK, everything we taught them came back to kick us in the behind, whether it was whether it was uh, making swords, whether it was introducing the periodic tables, chemistry, the almanacs, showing them what's around the world, things like this. Um, so talk about for a minute the importance of really understanding this chronology of history, because, you know, one of the problems I had with the 1619 project, even though they do have some good information in there. I wouldn't pass a law to ban it. You know, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. But one of the things that they do is they do mention 1526 when the Spanish try to set up a settlement in the South Carolina, Georgia area. Right. And they take about 100 Africans in there. That's 93 years before 1619. But they don't like really deal with that chronology <laughs> before 1619. Right. Okay, yeah. talk about the importance of understanding the, the African Moors and their connection to the Nile Valley region of Africa. Well, I think people should know that the Moors were from North Africa. 
mm-hmm. these were Muslims. These, these were these were African Muslims from the north, and um, they were able to bring a tremendous intellectual tradition into the Iberian Peninsula, into Spain and in parts of Portugal in 711 of the Common Era. And the Moors, they, you know, they're, they, uh, they don't just develop this in a vacuum. You have a tremendous intellectual tradition uh, that goes back many uh, millennia in the Nile Valley. And then right. also there's a great intellectual di- uh, tradition in West Africa, too. So that's that's Van Sertema's uh, yep. book. And that's part of the Journal of African Civilizations, which, by the way, is the greatest journal on African civilizations in the second half of the cent- second uh, 20th century from 1979 to 1994, 15 years of one of the most important uh, series of publications that we've seen. And, and the golden age of the Moors is part of that. But the Moorish intellectual tradition is very important because when they go into Europe in 711 and, and, and occupy Spain, they don't just go in and destroy. They bring knowledge. Right. So, right. so, they, so the, they bring book making and the book uh, distribution uh, industry. They mm-hmm. introduce universities. They introduce uh, the first streets with lights. They introduce right. architecture. The Moors also introduce. So people can't even talk about the the cultural aspects like the flamingo. You can't talk about the flamingo unless you look at the Morris influence in music and dance. Mm-hmm. Now the 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 Spanish Christians didn't necessarily like being occupied, but the reality is they were occupied by African Muslims, but it wasn't a destructive occupation, even though they may not have uh, been excited about it. But we can see that the Moors had a tremendous influence and it wasn't to go in and destroy and tear down things. They made right. very important contributions. And this is what is one of the hallmarks. But they do bring an intellectual tradition. They do help bring science into Europe because there was a dark age. They, they didn't know. And it's not an accident that the Moors stayed for, for over 780 years and when they were kicked out, as you were alluding to, in 1492, that same year, Columbus set sail in August of that same year. And, and by the way, Columbus was aware of uh, West Africa because he was a part of, of the enslaving group. He right. was aware of West Africa long before 1492. But one thing that Columbus was also aware of, that Africans were traveling west. He didn't know where or how far, but they were traveling west. So he had the idea that, that, that and, and they were called merchants, not just travelers, but merchants mm-hmm. with merchandise traveling west before 1492. So while Europe was unaware, it had no idea about the world, it was the cartography of the Moors that helped them, that helped introduce them to proper geography about right. the world. And so Columbus, yes, he was a risk taker in Europe. They thought the world was probably fat, flat. That's why it was difficult for him to get funding. But, Fert, but, but Ferdinand and Isabella finally came together and they pushed the Moors out, but they also financed Columbus's first of his four journeys. They figured it was no big loss because they weren't going. They sent mm-hmm. him and three ships and 90 men, and they figured that, well, if he falls off the side of the earth, then it's not a big loss for us. And, um, but that was very significant that in, in 1492, he takes the voyage and the world has not been the same, not because he discovered anything, but because of his ruthlessness. Correct. It was him who introduced slavery in the Americas. It was Columbus that introduced the slave trade. It was Columbus that introduced the scramble for the Americas. Mm-hmm. Before that, and then right after he comes and takes 25 Taino back to Spain uh, victims to, 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 to uh, so-called civilize them and to teach them Spanish, right and to show proof of a so-called successful voyage, Columbus uh, was geographically challenged. The man thought he was in India. So he called the people Indians. He had no idea he was in another part of the world. The, but the problem is, is that as soon as he goes back to Spain, word spread throughout Spain, but it spread throughout Portugal that he had found supposedly a new route to India. Uh, mm-hmm. wasn't, he, he didn't reach India, but nevertheless, that's when they decided that they were going to take they meaning the spanish and portuguese were going to steal whatever this new area was but the pope had to step in and broker a treaty called the treaty of tortoise cellular 1494 
1494, yes. 1494, absolutely. So they mm -hmm. they carved up the entire area, and they didn't even know where the hell they were. They just started, they said, look, uh, we know West Africa, so let's go so many leagues based on his 10 weeks, so, so many leagues to the West to try to figure out where he landed. They thought he was in islands near India. So anyway, the treaty actually divided all of the Americas and right. and and uh, Spain got the western portion and Portugal got the eastern portion. But the bottom line is that it split South America, and that's why in Brazil people officially speak Portuguese because of that treaty. But nevertheless, the Moors and the African voyages before that, and the and the map making and the cartography had a a definite in, influence on Columbus taking the risk. It was a risk for them because they had no one in the West. Um, had tried that before. Yes, the Vikings had come, but mm -hmm. they had not tried the southern route of uh, Columbus. So it's a lot that is there. But the bottom line is that these are very, very important episodes of a fundamental uh, influence of the Moors. And by the way, uh, the Spanish were, were absolutely impacted by the Moors. They called people Moors, which is short for Black or Moor. Uh, right. And they called the women Mora. Mora, Mora, you know the feminizers. So, and then people with names like Maurice and Morrison. That's yep. that's an influence of the Moors, influence by name. So it's quite Correct. a contribution that the Moors made to um, provide a foundation for for um, for the modern European uh, growth and development out of the, the Dark Ages. Absolutely, we can see the impact. Uh, uh, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay talks about how we can see the lasting impact of the uh, African Moors in the language uh, in uh, Europe, uh, words in European language, Maurice, um, different things like that. This is in reference to a Moorish boy uh, in their architecture. Uh, also, he talks about in their bloodline. Uh, so they're changing the complexions of a lot of Europeans in Spain and Portugal. Uh, to a lesser extent and say England, because that's further uh, west from uh, when they're going in from uh, Morocco right into the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. But we see we see this. Uh, we see them go all throughout Europe. Uh, and uh, he talks about uh, the war Schwarzenegger, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, where uh, uh, Nager is Austrian and German for Negro and um, uh, Schwartz is in reference to dark or swarthy. Okay. So, uh, and you study on a Schwarzenegger, he comes from Austria in the, in the bodybuilding world. He was known as the Austrian Oak. So you go and you, you look at that history. Um, and they lay out a lot of it here in the book that we mentioned, golden age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And there's so many scholars that have essays there. So that shows you the connection between the Nile Valley region of Africa, and also uh, some of the Moors, to a lesser extent, come from West Africa. There are different waves that go in, you know, over the hundreds of years, but to a lesser extent, West Africa. But you see they're taking the teachings from Africa, which was the uh, continent of knowledge, and they're taking the light of Africa into the dark continent, Europe, which was in the Dark Ages, okay? So and so we look at we're taught to look at Africa as the dark continent when really Europe was the dark continent. Europe was uh, pushed into what they refer to as the Dark Ages, 476 A.D., when the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed that, crushed that western portion of the Roman Empire. Uh, and then you have hundreds of years of civil war and strife and famine, different things like this in Europe. So we have a lot of this history backwards. And I think when we well, start. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in fact, I, I, this is what I cover in my book. So I have a mm -hmm. section on the mm -hmm. Moors in Spain from 711 mm -hmm. to 1492. Okay. So, so that's an actual section to lay out the Moors' influence. But we mm -hmm. also have to go back much earlier because yes, because the influence um, uh, the the African early African influence on the Greeks and Romans is much earlier and is absolutely profound. It's a yes. profound influence. And one one thing that people should know is that when the Greeks came in the fourth century before the common era un, under Alexander of Macedon, mm -hmm. and they start and they came in as political invaders and took over classical Kemet or so-called Egypt, the Greeks 
did not claim that they had originated this information and knowledge that people think that that's that they're giving credit for today so right. in uh, astrology and astronomy and medicine and religious rituals and mathematics and geometry the greeks did not claim this at mm -hmm. all this was done by the by scholars at the university of Göttingen in germany in the late 1700s and early 1800s, they're the ones that rewrote the history of the world and they took the ancient model and replaced it with the Aryan model. But if we right. look at what the Greeks and Romans did, it was unusual where they politically conquered the civilization of, of Kemet, but they culturally were following the practices of those that they conquered. This is very unusual. People usually, they impose their language and their political structures. It was the opposite. They were imitating African ceremonies, imitating African rituals, taking on African ceremonies, worshiping African gods, marrying African uh, women and so forth. That's what yep. they were doing. But, uh, and, but when they came, the civilization was already gone. It had disappeared, but they were imitating the early African civilization and they did not claim the Greeks and Romans did not claim that they created any of this. Like Lucian and Diodorus and Herodotus and right. Paul, they give great credit to Africans. Not once did any of them claim anything that that that, that they were the originators of. So so it's very important to know that this that the early African influence took place over two thousand years ago, and then what we would discuss the Moorish influence as another episode of a fundamental and a profound African uh, influence uh, upon Europe because the Greeks did not, like for example, even during the Greek, the classical period, mm -hmm. they did not have libraries. Even then they didn't have uh, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they didn't have libraries. All of a sudden now, Alexander invades Kemet and right. they didn't go in and start quote unquote building libraries. You don't start building institutions abroad that you don't have at home. Correct. And so this is one of the important things for folks to know. So there's libraries in temples throughout Kemet. There's, you can see the lot. So when I'm leading tours, we go inside the temple and you see where they kept the scrolls, the libraries. And the Greeks came around and they start, as I mentioned, imitating African practices. And you can tell the difference because when they come in, they don't understand it. They are um, trying to duplicate, but it's now, it goes from high level art and execution to crude, clumsy and incompetent imitations. And you can see uh, the crude, comp <laughs> clumsy and incompetent Im imitations in the, the, the outrageous paintings. And, and then it's just drawing, it's not spiritual anymore. It's just drawing. And, and, and I have, like, for example, you have people with two arms and uh, um, I'm sorry, two left arms or two, two arms. right hands because they don't know what they're doing anymore. You know, and so this is what's happening. But nevertheless, the influence was profound. And this is why I, I, I wanted to do the book, uh, the second edition, and, and add a little bit more because we got to make sure that that is very, very clear that, that a lot of the contributions that people think are European or Greek are not. For example, chemistry. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the reason the word is Kemet. We can look at the etymology right. or the history of the world word and you know and I so I, I put I put the etymology in in that and also wanted to make it very clear that that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the square of the hypotenuse, this is clearly documented by the Africans on a scroll that's in the British Museum, that this has right. nothing to do with, uh, with uh, Pythagoras. So the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c, c squared geometry that every 10th grader has to learn, this is made up, but this was fabricated by those uh, outrageous scholars in Germany in the late 1700s who rewrote the history of the world with no new evidence or data. And they took the uh, the Greek and Roman texts and turned them upside down and dismissed them because they had no problem giving Africans credit. And that's why people should read the Greek writers. They not once did they ever disparage Africans. They gave them high praise, even so much to say, Herodotus says that the, that the best looking people in the world were Ethiopia. He's talking about Kushites. Usually the people think mm -hmm. they're the best looking, but right. they said, no, the Africans were the best looking. So that's how much credit they gave to uh, Africans in the early period going back uh, a couple thousand years.
Yeah, a lot, you know, a lot of this really gets turned around in the 1700s and especially in the 1800s when uh, the Western world discovers uh, ancient Kush and they are astonished by the civilization that was built and didn't want to credit that civilization to what they call Negroes. Um, talk for a minute about uh, ancient Kush and, uh, and in that conversation because uh from my understanding kush is kush was more of a region uh than a country it may change at certain periods of time but it was more of a region but you also have uh what we call uh ancient nubia or tanahesi so so talk about those for a minute please yeah i appreciate that well one of the things that gets distorted is that the vast number of people they are using the anti-african archaeologist george reisner Mm -hmm. And Reisner had warped racial beliefs. So he did field work from 1907 to about 1932 in Egypt and Sudan, the Northeast African corridor. And the further he went south, the more disturbed Reisner was because uh, he saw black skinned people and clear evidence of an African civilization complex. So Reisner began to distort and misrepresent what he was finding. And he was really frustrated because he was there uh, with the absurd mission of looking for a white queen and couldn't find one. <laughs> so Reisner, uh, he, he's on a mad search for a white queen, so he's fabricating information. So the further he went south, he's seen Kushites, but in his mind, he can't give credit to them. He said that these people were incapable of these kind of developments, so he's mislabeling right. them. So what's happening now, and people are running with the ideas and the chronology of an anti-African racist, uh, and everyone agrees to that, but people still use his framework. How could that make sense? He's, his framework is based on the fact he can't give credit. So what happens is that the older civilization of Kush, Kush came first, right. and then Nubia, and then Kemet. But right. Reisner does not give credit to the older version, of the older original Kush. And uh, that's what's the most ancient part, but people are not in the field going to those places where there are still Cushitic groups that are in isolated locations because it's not easy to get there and people are using Reisner's framework. So what happens is that the Kush sites are just labeled the so-called black pharaohs who came much later and were imitating people in Kemet or Egypt, mm -hmm. imitating, they're originating. And right. not only they're originating, but their style is different. How they wore the crowns is different. They had the, not one cobra on the crown, but two. The the shape of the pyramids, uh, and they have it tapered on, on each corner, is very different. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a distinctive style, but there's cultural overlap because they're in one ecosystem. They're in one cultural complex up and down the Nile Valley. But Kush is the original civilization that goes to the south. That's why I've been doing work in not just Egypt, but I had to go further south to Sudan and southern Ethiopia and Kenya, South Sudan and Uganda. That's the region where you have Cushitic groups that are still around today. They speak a Cushitic language. They don't know about old Kush, but they certainly know that they're part of uh, Kush in some way. Like, for example, when I'm in South Sudan, it's interesting because they have a Kush bank in South Sudan. They have Kush airlines and people speak in a Kushitic language. They understand, they respect Kush. They just don't know about the ancient part, but they can right. explain uh, how they are practicing today, their cultural practices, and they know it relates to Kush, you know, whether it's in South Sudan or Southern Ethiopia among the, the different groups. And so this has been my work to really uh, help to uncover the deep history of Kush. So I coined the term Kushology, although there okay. are previous scholars, Drusilla Dungey Houston, and mm -hmm. there's been uh, John G. Jackson and Chancellor Williams, but they were using the term Ethiopia, the Greek word, and, and, the, and the word Ethiops mean burnt face, black face or kissed by the sun, but right. that's what the Greeks called it, but they're referring to Kush. So there's early scholars that we have to give credit to. And so what I did, I coined the term uh, Kushology in order to define and explain the field work that I continue to do in an area because 
Cush is the oldest, and we don't know that much about it because it's difficult work in the field, and we have to have the right framework in order to understand it because there are so many groups that, that have words and terms and practices that link directly back to Cush, but it's either ignored or the practice is mislabeled. So, for example, I remember on Facebook, what was this, a couple of years ago, I was showing that the people at the Louvre in Paris, they don't know what they're talking about. They've labeled some Kushites as Nubians. Now, we know Nubia was a high-level culture in the past. It's a great uh, group and, and cultural group today. But they labeled the Kushites as Nubians. But we know they're not Nubians because of the cultural markets, not scarification. That's a European um assessment of it is better to just call it cultural markings and the cultural markings of those in south sudan for example are very distinctive from other groups and they're and distinctive from nubians so when you have cultural markings across the forehead it's very uh specific when you go to south sudan it's very clear that they are nuer dinka or mandari and they'll tell you, the elders will tell you that, no, no, because this one dips a little bit. Or this one, the, the cut goes to the ear. And they're very distinct. This one is from Rubik. This one is from Euro. They'll tell you the regions of where this person's from by the cultural markings. And you can see those cultural markings in, in antiquity. These are Kushites. But then they're mislabeled okay. as Nubian. The difference because you can't know from or a general description go there and see you know what i mean and so that's what i've been yeah, doing to, uh, to really and yeah to understand the roots of ancient kush okay now and then you know um yeah. you you meant oh go ahead okay you mentioned uh the mandinka you said the mandinka right the uh the mandari Oh, Mandari. I thought you said Mandinka. Okay, okay. Because I know Mandinka in West Africa. Okay, Mandari. But I do know that Africans migrated from the Nile Valley region into Central Africa, into West Africa. We didn't stay put. We migrated different times, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes because of invasions. Because, uh, you know, I, I interviewed um, Professor, uh, Professor James Small in uh, 2023, I think it was, in one of the things that came up in the conversation is Africans being pushed southward and then also into Central Africa and later West Africa uh, when you have Arab invasions. Uh, uh, after Arabs conquer uh, Egypt, 642, uh, common era, and then uh, you, and, and you have um, uh, subsequent African, uh, su su subsequent Arab uh, oppression, things like this. You have Africans that, you know, are going to uh, move, going to migrate. So we didn't stay put. Um, you talked about. If I can say this too, uh, Brother Michael. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the, the other. Yes, that that's one reason for migrations. It's uh, mm -hmm. it, invaders and for political yes. reasons. The other reasons for the migrations is changing weather patterns. Yes. Because there's an ebb and flow in weather patterns. Because I, when I work with a NASA project, I, I studied the ancient weather patterns, and those also dictate migrations to not only to West Africa, but there's migrations also to the east as well. Like, like mm -hmm. folks won't necessarily know that there's a branch of the Nile River called Wadi Hawar. The Wadi Hawar branch cuts across Africa and empties into the Atlantic. Uh, and, and you can see that from the aerial uh, photography, from the remote sensor, you can see the actual channel of the Wadi Hawar branch of the Nile. And so that's very important because then that would indicate where there would be settlements at. Uh, right. And so forth. Yeah, I just wanted to mention. So, yes, in, in addition to what you said, there's the weather related weather uh, force migrations, too. Yeah. Um, you, you talked earlier in our conversation today, and those just tuning in, we're speaking with uh, historian uh, Professor Manu M. Pim, and we're talking about his book, A History of African Civilizations. Um, and we're, we're also going to talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, the father of Black History Month, and the father of Black History uh, in just a minute, because he has a section in volume two of his book that deals with Dr. Carter G. Woodson and Dr. Carter G. Woodson's research in Africa, dealing with Africa, African history, et cetera. Uh, and we've also been talking about the need for primary research. Uh, earlier in our conversation, 
and also the uh, broadcast you did on your Facebook page, December 15th, 2023, which is uh, one of the reasons why I reached out to you and said I wanted to have you back on the show uh, to discuss this, this the, the, to discuss your book. You talked about the short statured Africans, OK, uh, also known as the Khoisan, uh, some referred to as the Twa. Talk about them for a minute and. Uh, from my understanding, my my research, they went all around the world. They circumnavigated the globe as well. Talk talk about those short statured Africans for a minute, please. Yeah, uh, you know, um, my book, A History of African Civilizations, uh, it's pretty easy for people to think civilizations being spectacular cultures that built mighty monuments and structures and temples and tombs and pyramids, but that's just more advanced civilizations, the small stature people that are negatively called pygmy. We don't ever right. use that word, but right. um, they represent the first homo sapiens sapiens. Those yes. that are first, the first anatomical humans going back to about 250,000 years ago. Uh, not half ape, not half monkey, but flesh, blood and bone human beings who could join us as a third person and we wouldn't even take a second look. But those small stature people, we've been knowing about this because of the DNA research of Dr. Rebecca Kahn and her team going back to 1987. The mm -hmm. old bones have been found by, by the Leakies and other folks in East Africa, but the DNA research supported that. And now we know that everybody comes from a single African ancestor. We, we know that there's, there's only one uh, type of human is Africans. And those small stature people, four foot eight, four foot 10, they're the Mbuti, the Ife, the San. Sometimes it mm -hmm. could be the Koi and the Koi, the Koi. San or right. the, these different groups. And the small stature gave them an advantage because, first of all, in their mobility. Also, there's a less need for calories and so forth. But these are the, the people that stood up and taught us what it meant to be human. They're the ones who are the great ecologists that live in complete harmony with their environment. They're the ones that taught us the great ethical laws. So their position is an idea and what rules in their society is do unto nature as you would have nature do unto you. And so there's no structure, there's no hierarchy, there's no chiefs, there's no kings. They are semi-nomadic because they don't farm. They just forage, they hunt, they fish, and they'll stay at a place for a couple of weeks or so. And when they leave camp, you'll never know that they were there. So these are the people that really represent the first ones that taught us civilization, not the advanced groups. That's later because right. civilization, it, and I've defined it in the book, civilization is peaceful and harmonious relations among people and between people and their environment. That's peaceful and harmonious relations among people and between people and their environment because at the root of the word civilization, the basis of it is civil. And when we have civil relations, we have peaceful relations. So those are the ones that live in heart. And by the way, these small stature folks, they're not aggressive. They don't fight wars. They don't fight over ideology. So the right. large aggressive people have put them at jeopardy. So all of these people, as they've migrated, because of, there's always push and pull factors, the push factors would have been the changing weather or the lack of resources now. And when when and everyone knows that animals migrate when the seasons change, whether it's birds, wildebeest, you name it. And so when the food supply moves, the people must move to survive. And the only way in which a group can be sedentary, they must be able to farm and they can create a storehouse of food. So that the small stature of first Homo sapiens sapiens, yes, they migrated into certain areas. And, um, and uh, in some cases in Asia, they did not change their physical appearance because the weather pattern is the same. You look at right. the um, folks in Indonesia, in in Philippines and other places, they're as Africoid in their appearance as anyone else, whereas others did change. In in Europe, they changed. In Asia, they changed. They differentiated is what the term is because it, it, it's the either the, the law is either adapt or die. But right. these are the people that taught us these great laws of sharing and caring because they lived in plentiful environments and they are the ones that have provided a tremendous foundation for um, civilized life and conduct. But what what propagandists have done 
is overlook these small statue people and then say civilization means something else. So they so they can include Greek and Roman. So they'll say civilization is when you have farming, metallurgy, uh, cities, and yeah, writing, government, and writing. And, they, yep. and those five elements, well, wait a minute. The problem is those are things, but they don't deal with the quality of relationships. You know, some it's like the Romans. These they were very brutal. All they did was fight and enslave people. What civilized right. of that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so that's the distinction I'm making it in the book that you have real civilized folks, the small stature Africans that were the first Homo sapiens sapiens, and they represent the true definition of civil relationships as opposed to some contrived, made up, fake and phony definition that doesn't make sense. Like we're told that the origin of so-called civilization is in Athens, Greece in the fifth century before the common era. How could that make any sense when 80 to 90 the people 80 to 90 percent of the people in Greece were not even citizens, had no political rights, couldn't even vote. And that was all women, the poor, mm -hmm. foreigners and slaves had no rights in Greece. Where in the hell is a democracy? It's not a democracy of the people, for the people, by the people. It's a democracy for the few. This has been right. a bogus presentation to the world to uh, to say that the Greeks somehow created Civil, uh, civilization when they were anything but civilized in their conduct towards the people in Greek society. And besides that, all they were doing fighting all day long. Right. So exactly. This is what uh, has to be looked at to separate the facts from fiction. Okay. Now, the, the uh, Khoisan, they date back, their ancestral line dates back somewhere at least 100,000 years ago, maybe longer than that, something like that. Now, they, they, the Khoisan, we know they go into the Philippines, they circumnavigate the globe. Was there was there a presence of the Khoisan here in the land that we call the United States of America or a, gr or a greater aspect, North America? Was there a, a, a presence of the Khoisan? There, there, there was not, but, but what we know is this, and um, so we know that the uh, that these that the oldest group, so the, the so the Khoisan, so you mean like this is in southern African area, mm -hmm. um, but in East Africa, this is uh, like near uh, Tanzania and, and the Odavai Gorge area, and even the DNA work uh, research uh, with Dr. Khan and her team dealing with mitochondria DNA seems to support our Eastern African origin. But what we do know is that these these small stature people certainly have gone into Asia. They're very short sure. stature. Um, and we know that they were dark skinned when they left and they went into Europe. And this is why they have uh, uh, rickets, which is a deficiency of vitamin rickets. D. Right. Yeah, because this, the melanin is going to block some of the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Now, what we do have in the Americas, we definitely have the, the oldest inhabitants of all of the Americas is in South America in Pedro Ferrada, Brazil. So the evidence from Pedro Ferrada, Brazil, the oldest documented occupation in the Western Hemisphere, it goes back to at least 56,000 years ago because of the discovery of rock art and hearths. A hearth mm -hmm. is a fireplace. And so right. we've been knowing about Pedro Ferrada, Brazil in the, in the, the Sierra de Capivera National Park. We've been knowing about that since 1986. And uh, that's when they discovered the site. And the first they had the date of Pedro Ferrada at 48,000 years ago, but the discovery of the hearths, the fireplace mm -hmm. pushes it back to 56,000 years ago. But that's in South America because the reason why people were not in, in North America because there would have been no way to uh, come to the area because of the warm glacial period. The whole northern Warm, hemisphere is still locked up in ice. And the ice didn't begin to melt until about 25,000 years ago. And it created a corridor. It created mm -hmm. an opening that allowed people to migrate from Siberia in Asia across this opening in the ice into North America. But this opening didn't take place until much, much later than um, than the uh, settlements in South America, which means that the, the yeah, Bering Straits. So, yeah, yeah so, so so Bering Strait was was afterwards, but what we know is that uh, the people migrated by by watercraft, and mm -hmm. this is one of the problems that early historians have is that they have this ab absurd idea that the waters were somehow the waterways, the oceans and seas were somehow a barrier to travel. When in fact, 
the waterways have been a facilitator of travel. People have always been in uh, ingenious in traveling. So right. it's it's clear that they were in Page of Parada. The rock art doesn't lie. The hearths don't lie. I mean, who paints like that? Who who uh, who creates fire? Why do we need fire to cook food, to keep warm, to keep away animals? For many, for light. So we use fire, and no other species does that. So what the propagandists who want to maintain the Bering Strait theory, and matter of fact, I have a unit in that in, in, in my class. We call it not the Bering Strait theory, but the BS theory. And it's the okay. BS theory <laughs> because people did migrate through the opening of the ice, but the part of it that, that's incorrect and is BS is that that somehow represents the first inhabitants. No. Right. There were people that were already in the Americas, not only in Page of Ferrata, but Brazil, but Monte Verde, Chile, going back 33,000 years ago, or Huey Lactico, Mexico. There's a number of different sites in the Americas uh, long before um, people migrated through the Bering Strait, so that the small stature of people, um, and there's not really a clear indication of the height of the people in Page of mm -hmm. Ferrata, but their Africoid identity is very clear from the images. That's, that makes it very, very clear that they were of Africoid descent. Well, oh, um, I'm sorry, sorry, Brother Michael. One mm -hmm. other thing that, that, uh, that, that's very important, that in all over the world, including in Africa, the small stature people, all of them, with no exceptions, they live today in places of refuge, hiding, and safety. So they yeah. live in um, rainforest, like the Ituri rainforest in uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, or they'll live in desert environments like uh, the the Kalahari Desert, like the Koi and the other people, the San, and or they'll live in island islands, hillsides. But that's where these people live in places of isolation and hiding and safety because they're not aggressive. They don't fight, and right. this is why they don't fare well in the modern world. But everywhere we see them, they're in isolated remote areas uh, for safety and refuge. And that's what is very, very important to know. And in South America, uh, the evidence seems very clear that they were attacked much later by those that came through the Bering Strait. And, there, and you know, um, the, uh, people can find a documentary it's called Tracking the First Americans. Tracking, Tracking the, the First Americans. Americans. That one is very well done because it's on the work of Dr. Walter Nevis, mm -hmm. who's an archaeologist from Brazil, and those researchers uh, Professor Guidon, who uh, worked at the Pedro Fer Ferrada site, so that they have some reference to um, what I'm sharing, because I don't cover all of these details in my book, but uh, in my class, we go into great detail about these migrations. There, there, there was an article from uh, the New York Times that uh, I use in my classes, and I wanted to, I need to pull this up, because it talks about uh an african presence in brazil uh and i forgot the name of that and i'm looking for i'm looking for my files folder also um but it talks about the african presence in brazil and is going back tens of thousands of years ago um and let me see if i try to find this it's going back tens of thousands of years ago but also you have um, in, uh, uh, I think there was a presence in uh, Tierra del Fuego in, in South America, the southern tip. The tip, yeah. Argentina. Uh, uh -huh. uh, well, the, the southern tip of uh, South America. Right. Uh, I'm going I'm to see if I can find that article. Okay, so when you talk, uh, you, you talk about Dr. Uh, Carter G. Woodson in your book as well. And you, you, in, in the broadcast that you did, uh, December fifteenth, twenty twenty three, you talked about how Dr. Carter G. Woodson is left out of the conversation dealing with African history, um, uh, African culture, things of this nature. But his last two books dealt with uh, African history. Um, he he had uh, African uh, African history background, uh, and then uh, he uh, was working on another one. But he also had a book on uh, African uh, folklore, uh, African right. uh, um, myths and folklore as well. Talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who most of us know 
uh, co-founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915, um, uh, created Negro History Week, second week in February uh, 1926. Talk about his research in Africa, dealing with African history and culture. Yeah, that's, that's one of the most important developments in the 20th century regarding African civilizations. Carter G. Woodson is uh, very much omitted without justification from the focus and discussion on bringing African civilizations to the forefront. One of the things that uh, Woodson did, I mean, he, he created his organization, the Association of the Study at that time is called Negro Life and History. Now it's Association right. of the Study of African American Life and History. And Woodson uh, began to do his work in the early 20th century. And when Woodson was around up until when he passed in 1950, his focus was increasingly on African civilizations. But uh, from the time that Woodson led the charge to make the focus on uh, history of black people front and center when he created the, the week in the second week of February 1926, Africa had always been a central component for Woodson. So, and, and, and he's left out. So uh, a cu couple of things that folks should know. He wrote several books on Africa. You, you mentioned right. African myths and folk tales. That was one. The last two books he wrote was African Heroes and Heroines. And the last book is the African Background Outline. That right. was the last two books. Not only that, but the last three articles written by the great scholar who passed in 1950, the right. last three articles written by Woodson was a was a article series simply called Egypt, a three part series, and it was called Egypt because for Woodson the 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 mission was to to bring back the missing pages, the missing chapters, and the missing volumes of the black contribution to U.S. and world history. So for Woodson this was unacceptable that black people had been written out of the story of US and world history and contributions. So for him, it was to establish our humanity. So when Woodson is, is focusing on in his, in his essays and his books and his presentations uh, to his organization, when he's arguing that there has to be the missing pages put back into the story, He's not just talking about the experience here in the U.S. He's looking at a global experience. When he says world history, he means just that. But so when Woodson was around, not only did he is he writing about African civilizations in his articles, his essays, and his books, but even the theme of it, of the organization. You look at the organizational themes, and you see a number of themes during the lifetime of Woodson dealing specifically with Africa since that right. time. The organizations moved away from Woodson's position on Africa. And uh, the, the, the problem is that people don't even know if they look at the journal of, of uh, the journal. Now it's a journal of African-American life and history, but the journal of Negro history. Negro history. When mm -hmm. that was founded in 1916, the very first issue is dealing with Africa. And not only that, but he has a he has a team of writers who are focusing on Africa. So they, they, they from the very first uh, issue of the journal, Volume one, number one. There's several articles dealing with Africa, and 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 they constantly did book reviews, and they're on Africa. Not only from the first issue of the volume uh, uh, of the journal all the way through, but not only that, but even the bulletin. Later on, they created the bulletin of, of then it was called Bulletin of Negro History. Now it's the Bulletin of Black, uh, the Black History Bulletin. But in 1937, the very first issue, Woodson as the editor. He has a big old picture of Africa on page six, <laughs> a big old picture on the very first issue. And in right. fact, all the way through, there is focus on Africa. And this gets left out of the scholarly um, discussion. And, and, and when scholars are looking at the Black History Movement, they leave out Woodson and his unique focus on African civilizations. Like, for example, let me just give one example of what gets left out. So in okay. March of 1939, the, the so-called Negro History Bulletin, which was designed and focused on for teachers, so that teachers can teach the students, this is what Woodson wrote. He says, sculpture reached his, his first, and, and, but, sorry, let me go to the title. The title is The Negro in Art from Africa mm -hmm. to America. And this is the March 
1939 issue, volume two, number six. And this is what Woodson writes. He says, sculpture reached its, its first high, high level in ancient times under the Egyptians. The Sphinx near the pyramids of Giza, the temple at Luxor, the rock temple at Abu Simbel, and the obelisk show the greatness of Egyptian architecture and sculpture. And so he's claiming Egypt or Kemet as an African civilization, but he's writing articles all the way through. He's reviewing books like um, uh, Lorenzo Turner on, uh, on Africanisms in the Gullah dialect. And Woodson's reviewing the books like that because Africa was front and center for Woodson. There's not a time that Woodson was not writing articles and or books about Africa or his organization having themes dealing specifically with Africa. What right. what Asla has done, and you, you mentioned uh, 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 Daryl Scott, he's, mm -hmm. he's one of the last persons defending Woodson when Woodson said that self-publishing is self-defense. And so what the organization has done, they've left out Woodson's work on Africa, not because it's not there, because they're uncomfortable. So Professor Scott, Dr. Scott, he was arguing that how in the world could you disregard the work of Woodson when he established in 1922 Associated Publishers? He said that- yeah. publishers Associated Publishers, Publishers, Inc. Yep, the publishing company. 1922. Yep. <laughs> and so right. the thing is, is that Woodson said that nobody can edit and change your work if you're publishing yourself. So that's mm -hmm. why for him, he can say whatever he wanted to say, with the, like you had the great book there, The Miseducation. He was able to say what he wanted to say, when he wanted to say it, and, and who he wanted to say it to. But what the organization did is decide to disrespect the tradition, disrespect Woodson. And now, if you want to get the journal, you got to go through the University of Chicago. And right. Dr. Scott was one of the last battlers to say, this doesn't make sense. This is not Woodson. This is not right. Woodson's tradition. But guess what? Those folks are the ones, and they may be listening. So what? Challenge the evidence. Mm -hmm. They're the ones uncomfortable with Africa. That, that's why they- I get that impression. I yeah. get that impression that many of them are uncomfortable them. with Africa. They're yep. uncomfortable with Africa, and that's why they would rather give up independence against Woodson's position and give the publication to the University of Chicago. So folks, if you want to get the journal of what's now called a journal of African-American history or get the back issues of the journal of Negro history, you got to go through the big uh, mainstream institution, University of Chicago Press, and not through the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History because those professionals who have the money and resources to remain independent, but they don't have the orientation. So they disrespect mm -hmm. Woodson and they disrespect his tradition. There's no defense to it. So kudos to the, your, the guests you had on because yeah, Dr. Scott Daryl was, Scott. He, Daryl mm -hmm. Scott, he's one of the last ones fighting uh, to try to keep a respectful focus on Woodson's vision. So not only have the or has the organization give up the independent uh, publishing apparatus, but they've abandoned Africa. And you look at the uh, the theme. Now everything is African American. There's nothing wrong with that. But look, but brother Michael, here's here's how we do it. In in the I, and, I, and I have some of the themes. Go ahead, keep talking because we got okay, some well, of the themes. Because there's been a theme. There's been an annual theme for Black History Month, Negro History Week, African American History Month since 1928. Yes. Okay, and Dr. Woodson picked these themes. He died. He died in 1950. Go ahead and, and go ahead, and then we're, we're gonna go over a few of these themes that dealt with Africa. Because most African Americans don't know there's been an annual theme for Black History Month. When I do Absolutely. my presentations on, yeah. on African American History Month, I said we don't have to keep recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year. We don't understand how powerful this monthly cultural celebration is and why it was actually created. Go ahead. Yeah, as a matter of fact, to that list, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll also put 1972 on that list, African mm -hmm. art, music, literature, and a valuable cultural experience. But look, here's, so I'm glad you have that there because this is new information that gets omitted. So yes. if, if we look at the uh, focus of the annual themes, Africa's front and center, because what Woodson said that the goal was to put back in the missing pages of world history. What the hell do you think they was talking about? World history is right. talking about Africa. So that's right. why you have African themes. And the last African theme was really 1992 because, and, and, and it was because of the great work of Van Sertema and others who challenged and exposed Columbus. And, and mm -hmm. that, that's about it since that time. Um, 
but everything's been just a okay now here's what we do uh, in the tradition of Woodson two two important things I want people to know number one okay in the, the current theme uh by Asala and they set the national theme for those that, that follow them this year is African Americans and labor mm -hmm. so we changed it it's um we have uh ours was uh you know the classical African contributions uh in art from Africa to the America uh the Americas because for us there's no way to separate the black experience in the Americas from the African uh background and origin and so whenever they have a theme only focusing on African American we add the African component to it every single time but right um so you know um uh so so they have so so that African Americans in the arts that's okay but it's not in the Woodsonian tradition what so the Woodsonian tradition would be the achievements in art in Africa and the Americas that's why I read this this uh this article he wrote the Negro in art from Africa to America that's in the Woodsonian tradition and um but but the people are not comfortable with Africa and like right. the great Kwame Ture said if you start your history in slavery the best you can be is a good slave and that's what we're dealing with now we have people that have disrespected Woodson and they have only focused on African American because that's what they're comfortable comfortable with so uh that's one issue to be aware of the other issue is that it should be properly called if we're following Woodson's direction and his leadership and his insight it should be called African Heritage Month because okay. that's what we're focusing on African heritage when people say Black History Month to them, it means to, to focus on uh, issues of struggle, of how black mm -hmm. people overcome slavery, escape slavery, or how, how they got their ass kicked by the police or something like that. Right. And what Woodson was concerned about af after the celebration was founded in 1926, if we see Woodson in, in the 1930s, he's criticizing at that time what was being done, always talking about something negative in black people. He said, mm -hmm. look, we have to assert our humanity. We have to look at black contributions, achievements, and um, and contributions in the world, and not always associate black people with a problem. This is why Woodson focused on it as a celebration, and he's embracing right. Africa. They had plays, they had all kind of skits, plays, all kind of things, um, important information about contributions because Woodson understood that we had to assert our humanity and use at least some time of the year to focus on our unique achievements, accomplishments, and contributions in the world. And this is why he continues to embrace Africa. So as he's learning more, he's writing more about it. But what's happened is that people are more and more, they're uncomfortable with Africa. They leave out his Woodson's focus on Africa. So when they say Black History Month, it means really, as, as some of us would say, it, it's a Negro version where you're only dealing with safe folks who are only right. uh, you can only talk about them if they're fighting against slavery or, or during the civil rights or human rights era, which are great struggles, but it's very limited in scope. And right. so African Heritage Month means that we have to embrace Africa as we look at the overall black contributions. This is why at our college, we've always had themes that that associate the celebration. That's what we have with Africa and our experience in the Americas. And we tell folks that we don't uh we do not endorse all of the negativity you all want to bring in february because this is a chance for us to assert our humanity so it right. should be african heritage month as a reminder that africa must be the foundation for our perspective but those that are dealing with black history month most of that is negative like for example i saw a flyer somebody um shared something with me that somebody had a, a black history month event and all i saw was a fashion show and some drinking what the hell is this? <laughs> this is Black History Month event. You know what I mean? Because it ain't right. got nothing to do with Africa. And it's got nothing to do with contributions to humanity. So, Brother Michael, what's important is that we reteach and re-educate it, even the informed community, the so-called whatever they call it, the conscious community, to shift. Because this is the only way in which we can take back the focus created by Woodson and separate it from all this craziness and make sure that we define it as African Heritage Month and force people to have positive events 
that embrace our unique contributions to humanity, which I lay out in my book. I have a whole section on these contributions in math, medicine, architecture, social organization, medicine, you name it. And these contributions must be front and center. And this is what the concern was of Woodson as he was criticizing those folks that only focused on problems and not the contributions of black people. Excellent, excellent. And uh, the name of Professor Manua Pym's book and Pym's book again is A History of African Civilizations. This is the second revised edition, A History of African Civilizations. You can get it at his website, advancingtheresearch.org, advancingtheresearch.org. We have it up here on the screen. We're going to put the link again here in the thread of the broadcast. Please support this brother. Order his book today. Uh, this is great reading material, great material to use with your children. Uh, I'm going to pull this uh, back up, th this slide I have, because I, this is a slide from um, my African-American History Month um, <laughs> presentations. And All this right. is research I did uh, years ago. Uh, if we just look at some of the themes. Now, there's been an annual theme since 1928. And if you go to Asala's website, asala.org, A-S-A-L-H.org, they have all the themes going back to 1928, annual themes. 1928, civilization, a world achievement. 1933, Ethiopia meets era and truth. 1935, the Negro achievements in Africa. 1936, African background outlined. Now we know Dr. Woodson died in 1950, but uh, 1960, uh, the annual theme was strengthening America through education in Negro history and African culture. I don't understand how you deal with Negro history and African culture, but okay. Uh, <laughs> this is 1960. So, I, but in 1971, African civilization and culture, a worthy historical background. Um, and then we know in, let me see, I have a Salah's website up here right now. Uh, we know in, uh, let's see, 1992, you talked about African roots, experience new worlds, pre-Columbus, to space exploration. Uh, so that was the 500 year commemoration of uh, Columbus setting sail on his first voyage. Uh, 1987, Afro-Americans and the Constitution from colonial times to the present, et cetera. Uh, go ahead and talk about that for a minute. Then I, and then I have the article that I was looking for from the New York Times that talks about uh, Brazil and South America. Yeah, th these themes, it clearly shows Woodson's consistent and well-rounded uh, focus on Africa. And right. as you mentioned, he passed in 1950. So right. when the themes continued in 1960, 1971, 1972, it's because these are people that he was, that was still around that he was mentoring and influenced. Mm -hmm. But as, as uh, time has gone on, they've separated. They, I'm talking about the organization from Woodson's focus on Africa and right. the community and the public has done has 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 fallen into this unfortunately of separating woodson from africa and separating his scholarship from africa because woodson more and more was focusing on egypt ethiopia i mean i can read so many different articles and statements that he made about about ethiopia as the forerunner of kemet he says that that ethiopia yeah. which came first it was the forerunner and, and, right. and his book ethiopia and kush right abyssinia the yeah. grandmother yes mm -hmm. he, Go ahead. he's talking about that and he's he's mentioning uh uh in his book the african i mean the the negro in our history this is when in 1922 this is when he starts to focus on this and the negro in our history this was the definitive textbook for decades until john hope franklin wrote his book um but before john hope franklin's book from slavery to freedom woodson's book the the negro in our history was the standard text and so every aspect of his work, including the organization, you see it through the themes. You see Woodson's influence on Africa. But Brother Michael, we would never know that today if you read and listen to these scholars today. It ain't that right. the evidence is hard to find. Like you say, anybody can go to Oslo's website and see the themes and, right. and see the other publications. It's not difficult, but of course, now you got to go to the University of Chicago. You can get some of these early um volumes and get the articles on. So this is why it was important for me in the second revised edition. This is why it was important for me to um, to to expand 
the second edition and include a chapter on Woodson to blow up the myths and misinformation that is across the board. I mean, you know, people who've read a lot, they know about the miseducation of the Negro, but there's a lot of other crucial and critical things that are not known about Woodson because we haven't read deeply enough and scholars have carefully omitted Woodson's work on Africa. And that's why um, it's very important to for me to get this information out. And when I've been doing presentations, people have been very surprised. Like, like for example, to show you Woodson's work as he's the editor of the, of, of the journal, so Journal of Negro History, Volume 1, Number 1, January 1916. Look, they have um, the first edition, uh, first issue. This is what was impressive about Woodson. He wasn't writing alone. He had a right. team of writers that was making this contribution. So Monroe Work wrote a piece called The Passing Tradition and and the African Civilization. This is the very first issue. And then there's uh, Stafford who wrote a book, The Mind of the African Negro, Africans, as reflected in this Proverbs. Then there is, uh, you know, and then there's a, uh, a book review, another book review, Negro Culture in West Africa. Hmm. So you got this in the, the very first volume, Woodson pulls together a pool of writers to help support his writing and in, 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 uh, in scholarship in the area. So it's a body of writers focusing on Africa in the very early period, uh, over 100 years ago. And we would never know that until right. we pull up those themes, which are public. You don't even have to register and become right. a member to see that. And then uh, and you got the journal and there's the bulletin, plus there's Woodson's work. So this is why I added the chapter to the book in order to blow up this nonsense about the misrepresentation. You talk about the, the miseducation of the Negro. This is miseducation all over again by his own organization, miseducating people about their own founder. And I'll Correct. challenge anybody because documentation beats conversation is right there. And, Absolutely. And so, and, and this is a, a, a key. And you know what? This is the second time in my research that I found this. The first was when I was shocked to see that the biggest file that Dr. King kept was this file on, on, on Africa, Africa and the African liberation movements. So here you got two 20th century giants and people around them have totally misrepresented the record because they're not comfortable. And not because right. these men didn't focus on Africa. It's because the propagandists have decided mm -hmm. to omit this information. That's why it's so crucial, brother, to, to challenge people and make sure that we begin to call it and conceive of it and execute February as African Heritage Month to break away from the craziness around Black History Month where you got nothing but superficial <laughs> events that have nothing to do with Woodson. And we should not... Right want any part of that. And just to give people example, if they don't know what I'm talking about. They had an event at UC Berkeley out here uh, a few years ago. It was some mm -hmm. black guy. He had apparently success at getting some white nationalists out of the KKK. So that became a Black History Month event uh, to show his success in getting some white supremacists out of the KKK. And they put that on our website at the college. Somebody told me about it. I said, you know what? You got a few minutes to take that nonsense down. So we don't support that. How in the hell right. does this become a part of our sacred celebration? You know, it's about achievements, accomplishments, accomplishments and contributions in the world and to assert our humanity and not deal with all of the negativity that we hear and know about and learn about all the time. We cannot always associate black people with a problem. But that's why we that's why I'm focusing on it and really telling the community we got to break away and move forward in February in the Woodsonian tradition and embrace Africa. Exactly. And, 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 and just so people know, Dr. Woodson chose the second week in February, not because February is the shortest month of the year, but because, because it contains the birth dates of uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, assumed birth date of Douglass. Douglass didn't know his exact birth date. So he uh, took the birth date of February 14th most of us know that as Valentine's Day and then Abraham Lincoln's birthday, uh, February 12th, because going back to when 
uh, Frederick Douglass dies in 1895. Basically, each birthday after that, we had celebrations in our community for Frederick Douglass. And then also there were celebrations that we had in our community for Abraham Lincoln's birthday as well uh, after, you know, Lincoln's assassinated 1865. So because those two, uh, you already had those celebrations taking place in the African-American community, Dr. Woodson inserted this new cultural holiday, this new cultural celebration into that period. OK, so that's why it's in February. It has nothing to do with February being the oldest, coldest month of the year, the shortest month of the year. And it's not something white people gave us either. Right. I, I hear this myth also. White people gave us the month of February. No, we took it. OK, we created this. Um, I want to go to this article here. Uh, this is the one I was looking for. This is from the New York Times. Um, discoveries challenge beliefs on humans arrival in the Americas. OK. And it talks about Sarah uh, de uh, Capavera, uh, mm -hmm. which is what you were talking about. This is from right. March 27th, 2014, Simon Romero for The New York Times. It talks about uh, Dr. Guidon, who, who you yep. mentioned. And this is one I, I use in my classes. But it talks about uh, here right here. Researchers here say they have unearthed stone tools proving that humans reached what is now Northeast Brazil as early as 22,000 years ago. The discovery adds to the growing body of research upending a prevailing belief of 20th century archeology span in the United States known as the Clovis model, also called the Clovis culture or what have you uh, in New Mexico. Uh, which holds that people first arrived in the Americas from Asia about 13,000 years ago. So this is, I think this is what you were talking about? Uh, partly, uh, brother. Partly. Uh, the, the problem with this article, it's like mm -hmm. the articles that I share with students, is that in mainstream publications, they are willing to admit the earliest or youngest dates from a site because yes. an archaeological site, because of the different levels, they're the mainstream first of all they dismiss the evidence but if they ever even acknowledge it like at monte verde they'll deal with the top level and not the lower levels and right. so and so professor guidon did not come up with 22 000. professor guidon specifically and her team they dated the page of Ferrat so that the forty eight thousand. so professor guidon they dated the, the Page of Ferrata site, which is in the Sierra de Capavera National Park. And uh, so in the National Park, Sierra de Capavera National Park, the uh, Page of Ferrata is 48,000 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, and that's before the charcoal at the hearth. The hearth, um, this dates it now to 56,000 years ago. So yes, it's the same site, but this article is mixing up it looks like they're mixing up some of the dates, but it's definitely the right. It's the oldest clearly documented site. And Professor Guidon was attacked simply because the dates blow away all the Bering Strait ideas and theories. Because the right. you know, it's interesting, the 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 um scholars and scientists in Europe don't have much problem with the date. The people who debate the dates are those in the Americas because they've built careers on it. And so they are willing to fight and destroy anybody's career who has any dates before this 13, 14, 15,000 year barrier. So there's right. many different sites and Page of Ferrata is the one that that uh, gives them the most heartburn and Monte Verde gives them heartburn. Um, and, 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 and so does um, uh, the other sites such as Puebla, Mexico. It gives them heartburn. Puebla, Mexico. There's no way that they can dismiss this other than by claiming what what can they claim if somebody made a dating error? Wait a minute, these are professionals. What do you right. mean a dating error? Prove the dating error. They can't prove the dating error. So it's then to question the motives. Um, right. like they will question the motives of um Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre, who came up with the Huey, who who dated the Huey Lactical site in Mexico. And um that site is very, very old. And they question her motives and uh, right. said, hey, we're not going to publish this unless you take a zero off. So I'm not changing my dates. But this exactly. is exactly so. So so what it is, is that, you know, in this field, early, uh, early American studies, it's people teach what's useful and not what's truthful because they're right. defending 
and fighting to maintain their turf and their hegemony and dominance in the field. They're not, it's not scholarship, it's not science, it's political, is what it is. Right. And that's why they dismissed the Sierra de Capoeira National Park, where you have the Pedro Ferrada site, the paintings, human remains, there's mm -hmm. artifacts. Oh, well, those must be geofacts created by nature. Really? This is an absolute <laughs> artifact. This is coming up with stuff. It's the kind of intellectual gymnastics and somersaults that the dishonest people who represent the BS theory um, are right. Are the known Baron to. Street theory, right? Yeah. Now and, and they, and they've destroyed a lot of careers by people who don't go along with it. Now, uh, once again, for those that don't know, the name of this article: Discoveries, Challenge, Beliefs on Humans' Arrival in the Americas. This is from the New York Times. March 27, 2014, by Simon, Simon Romero. So though the, the, that 22,000 years ago, 48,000 years ago, who were these humans? Were these the, the short-statured Africans, the Khoisan? Who, who were these people? The, the, they wouldn't necessarily be Khoisan, but these were, these were Africans uh, without a doubt. And mm -hmm. this has been determined very clearly. So, so what, what I would share with people is a resource that I had mentioned so if, if they don't read the work of Professor Guidon or um, uh, or Black and One or or the other archaeologist, then they should at least and you can find it on YouTube. It's tracking the first Americans and tracking, tracking the, the first, first Americans. Yeah, the, that's the, a documentary, the, right? It's a documentary. It's only about an hour because the first people who established the like the site in Brazil they were attacked by a different racial group. You see battles through the rock art and you see a mm -hmm. different racial group, a different racial type also found in the skeletal evidence as well. And so, um, but they may not, um, you know, because people migrate in, th th that's a long migration. So what uh, the people in Brazil would have come from and what the, argument and research shows they would have might they, they would have migrated by watercraft from Melanesia or Australia. So they, they, they wouldn't okay. have been Khoisan per se, but they would have been Africans. And in the early times, they were small stature um, and they certainly would have come from that area by boat. And that's what um, the evidence leads us to at this point, that they were Africoid people who migrated in by by watercraft. Uh, let me, I, I just want to go to one more section here. Of this article, um, Dr. Guidon remains defiant about her findings. There, now, also, just so people know, in this article, there's a video interview with her from the New York Times as well. At her home on the grounds of a, of a museum, she found it to focus on the discoveries in uh, Serra de Capavera. She, she says she believed that humans had reached these plateaus even earlier around 100,000 years ago and might have come not over land from Asia, but by boat from Africa. Uh, talk about that for a minute, please. Well, I think it's important. Um, so I have some uh, articles, um, some of the, because uh, an article like this, uh, what we do is we look at where was the original publication and original studies uh, published because this is a summary of 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 uh Edom's work so right. what i share with the students is some of the original writing where she because uh if she's a, if 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 a researcher is speculating about some dates they know they're going to get attacked now she didn't expect to get attacked but she learned that that's what it was so mm -hmm. she moved away from speculation and going by the definitive dates even then she was still attacked but that's when it was clear that it was around these Africans about 48,000 years ago. So it's Professor Guidon's work. And the other person I was thinking of is Dr. Walter Nevis. Dr. Dr. Walter, Walter Nevis. Nevis from Brazil. Uh, it's also his position and belief because he's an uh, anthropologist dealing with skeletal remains that uh, there would have been Africans traveling from Australia or Melanesia, uh, or black people's traveling from Australia or Melanesia, but they ultimately would have come from the African continent. And that's what his argument is. Uh, but from this quote um, from uh, Guidon, uh, I would like to you know, see it more closely, but she clearly argues the same thing, that these are unmistakably Africans and 
what happens or well, what happened to these original Africans is that they were attacked. They were attacked and they were largely wiped out by what they were calling mongoloid. This is a term that they were using, right? So the right. people came in through the Bering Strait came later and they largely wiped out these original Africans who were in Brazil. Uh, but the fact that the Africans are in Brazil, this is pretty well established by the archaeological record. The fact that these were two separate groups, uh, clearly different in appearance, that fighting, this is also pretty well established by the uh, evidence of fighting and the clear artwork. You can clearly see it uh, for sure that these are separate groups fighting. And so Nevis and Guidon, these are different researchers, different research teams, but through their, through their own individual angles have come to the same conclusion that these are African migrants that were there first um, going back 56,000 years ago. And Nevis and Guidon both, you know, and this is this is upsetting to the Bering Strait theorists because yes, it is. <laughs> you know, they come by David Hopkins because David Hopkins, when he wrote um, the Bering Strait land bridge, when he wrote his work in 1967 or so, that's when scholars started to then promote not just the Bering Strait theory, but the Bering Strait fact that people okay. came in through the North and that no one else could have been in the Americas because in their mind, no one could have traveled other than by foot. They didn't right. have the ingenuity or the creativity uh, to travel by watercraft, which is absurd. Uh, the right. waters, waters have never been a barrier to travel. They've been a facilitator of travel. And it's people in the US who mainly have problems with it, but people in South America, scholars in Europe, Scientists in Europe, they don't have the same uh, issue, but the Americans, they do because it's political. Because, you know, and one thing people should know, why would somebody fight facts or why wouldn't they if they're the top of the class that people right. have to buy their books? And when they turn those books in the textbook, they're making go, a lot of money. Go ahead and keep talking for a minute. I'll be right okay. back. Go ahead, so they, 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 okay. So, so they're making a lot of money with textbooks. <laughs> they, they, uh, they get a good salary, very nice lifestyle and they um, give exclusive interviews which helps to elevate their stock elevate their uh their um, status and when they're at the top of their field you would think that people would just be humble not at all if someone comes up with a new discovery they don't call to congratulate they will attack and this is what the standard is if somebody doesn't know that they're naive this is exactly what happened this is why michael cremo um, and his colleague wrote the book Forbidden Archaeology. Forbidden Archaeology. In other words, archaeological discoveries that have been attacked. So this is why Forbidden Archaeology is a very important uh, resource because Cremo is pulling together archaeological discoveries in one book. And he uses the case of uh, Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre at Huey Lactical, Mexico to show that that not only has did the Bering Strait theorists, they like the Bering Strait Mafia, not only did, did they end Dr. McIntyre's career uh, as a respected researcher at, at, at the US Geological Survey, the last I checked, she was working at a nursing home as a gardener, but they don't, wow. allow, they don't allow anybody to challenge them. So they're, that's why I call them the Bering Strait Mafia. They've ended a lot of careers because they're defending their turf just like a gang member or a thug would do. And you say, well, why would a scientist? Because it's about money, clout, and influence. That's why. And that's that's what we have in early American archaeology. This is why I spend time on it to teach students research methods and introduce them to a lot of the original records and the evidence. And I say, you make your mind up. Here's the evidence from Nevis and Guidon and all of the other scholars. What do you think? What do you think you're looking at? But it's so many different sites. There's no way to deny all of them. Um, and that's right. That's exactly. The first unit. That's actually the first unit in my U.S. history class, part one. And we deal with the, the Bering Strait theory. And um, and then by the time we finished the Bering Strait theory, meaning people migrated from the north, from Asia into North America, and became the first inhabitants of the Americas about uh, 14 to 15,000 years ago. That's what the theory is. But by the time we 
learn the theory and look at the evidence against the theory, then the students know why we refer to it accurately as not the Bering Strait, but the BS theory. <laughs> the BS theory. Okay. Now, uh, i just curious, you, you're talking about different archaeologists. Are you familiar with Dr. Albert Goodyear at the University of uh, South Carolina, archaeologist at the University of South Carolina? No, I don't, I don't think I am. Okay, so I, I first found out about Dr. Albert Goodyear from uh, my friend who's now an ancestor, Dr. David M. Hotep. And Dr. David M. Hotep wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And actually, when the, art, the article from the New York Times that I just showed you when it came out in 2014, I sent that to him as well because he's been saying that um, uh, the African presence in a lot of these areas is older than what we've been told. Um, and he gave the example, he was the one that told me about uh, 56,000 years ago in uh, South America, in, in, in Brazil, specifically Brazil. Um, so I, I, just, I just wanted to ask you about this. So there's an article and uh, the jury is, is probably still out on this discovery, but uh, this dealt with, this uh, uh, article came out, uh, all the news outlets had stories on this. This particular one is from uh, NBCNews.com, Mastodon, Mastodon bone findings could up in our understanding of human history. And this article is from, uh, if people want to read it, April 26, 2017. But the, the main thing that I wanted to focus in on here is they mentioned Dr. Albert Goodyear, and I'm familiar with some of his work. Uh, but the article, go, going to your point, how um, archaeologists who put forth evidence that contradicts the status quo in archaeology, especially uh, evidence that goes against the Clovis culture model or the Clovis model, they are attacked. Um, it, it, this article says, and the archaeology mainstream is very unforgiving of researchers who <laughs> challenge the accepted dates, said Albert Goodyear of Dr. Albert Goodyear of the University of South Carolina, who's been working to prove for years, FOR, for years, that stone tools found in a South Carolina site date to as long as 50,000 years ago. Uh, now, Dr. Albert Goodyear is a white man, just so people know. He said, quote, there is a lot of ignorance and arrogance about just how little we know about the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so he was not involved in this uh, discovery in San Diego dealing with the Mastodon skeletons. He said these things are very controversial. OK, very controversial. But uh, he, he did say the discovery in San Diego is compelling. Um, and let me see. Now, OK, so just go ahead and comment on that. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because the discovery that he made in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004, um, he and his team said they found 13 different types of evidence documenting a, uh, a, a presence of humans here in this land. So it'd be uh, the uh, South Carolina, Georgia area. Um, Going back, he said it dates back at least 51,700 years ago, okay? But just, just talk about what he's saying when archaeologists present evidence that contradicts mainstream archaeology, how they get attacked. Can you hear me? Thank you. It's, it's kind of in and out, but yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, let's talk about, well, uh, th that's a uh, one of a number of episodes where people have been attacked because they challenged the Bering Strait Mafia. Yeah. And the Bering yeah. Strait Mafia, they're very, they're, they're very fierce. They're fighting for turf. It's not about evidence. It's about ideology and and maintaining their turf and their financial status. Because like at the when people have textbooks, they make a lot of money, and students are the victims of it. That's why there's a movement for zero cost, uh, zero textbook costs, or ZTC. Wow, wow. And so that's big. And so like on our website, for example, for our classes at Contra Costa College, there's um, there's a symbol now, you know, of whether or not you have a zero textbook cost, because that's right. the position now to protect students from this high price pricing of textbook. But that's part of the revenue stream. 
plus uh, doing exclusive interviews for the History Channel or National Geographic. Yes. That's another revenue screen, stream, plus they get grants and fellowships. That's another rev revenue stream. So when newer scholars come about and they find something that directly contradicts the dates and details presented earlier, then what we're asking these folks to do is to be honest. Right. And, and potentially give up a very nice lifestyle and they're not willing to do it. So this is why they usually close ranks and they attack. And, uh, and you know, when you walked away, you might have heard it, but this is why Michael Kramer wrote the, wrote the book uh, Forbidden Archaeology, because there's a lot of these examples where not only is the archaeological evidence challenged, but the people and their credibility is challenged. So I use Dr. Virginia Steve McIntyre. She had mm -hmm. nothing to gain by making something up. She's a credible scientist, asked to come in, date the site and then was attacked and her career destroyed. But these are a number of examples like that because the barrier is this, anything older than 14 to 15,000 years ago up yep. turns the theory. Yes. So, so, so the theory no longer makes sense. So yes, we know that people migrated in from the North, but the part of the theory that doesn't make sense is that this is not the first time people came into the Americas. That's the part that breaks down. Yes, we know they migrated in, but there were people already in the Americas. So that example that you're referring to from South Carolina is one of many, many examples throughout mm -hmm. North America, Central America, South America that flat out and directly contradicts this position. You know, like the footprints at Puebla, Mexico. You, right. You, and it's, 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 these are documented by credible sources. This was like a Discovery Channel on their site, I found this uh, from, this was 2003, if I, mm -hmm. I think it's 2003. So it's been two decades. And um, and Pedro Parada, 1986. Uh, Monte Verde, Chile, this was uh, 1998, reported in the New York Times. You know, right. so even in mainstream press. So this is what happens. People promote dates. There's a skull in Del Mar. W once people promote dates, they're gonna get attacked. So right. the question is, do you stand by your evidence, most times people adjust. They lower the dates to make it closer to the 13, 14, okay, 15 14. thousand year old Clovis barrier. Right. So, so that they can keep their career. That's what right. most of them do. It, it's a career move. It's not about evidence. It's about saving my behind so I can keep a job type of position. That's what they do. McIntyre didn't do that. She stood on the yeah. evidence and uh, people around her ran away because they didn't want to have their careers destroyed. So there's so many examples and uh, mm -hmm. people are not willing to give it up because they're defending their turf like a vicious gang member would do. But they're right. operating in the academic arena. And that's what makes it more troubling because without thought, people think, oh, yeah, well, scientists are honest. No, the scientists are the ones who are leading the starters of historical evidence and data. That's what they're about, including Samuel Morton and the rest of these folks who are creating wild ideas about human remains so so that example brother is one of a number of them that that uh should be known about right i, I just want to give this source here and then we're going to wrap up uh with your book and you can tell people again how to get your book so this was an article i, I learned about dr albert goodyear from dr david m hotel everybody can go read this article this is from sciencedaily.com and there were other articles when this came out this this article came out november 18 2004 called new evidence puts man in north america fifty thousand years ago here's a picture of dr albert goodyear like i said he's a white man and this put if if, if this is true this puts an african presence in north america fifty thousand years ago but this is the discovery that he and his team made in south carolina and he has been attacked and i, I quoted him in, in that article from 2017 he has been attacked and they're trying to the establishment archaeologists are trying to disprove his <laughs> discovery and the reason why is if they have to admit that there were people here before the clovis culture in new mexico people gonna find out that these were african people if you if you have evidence that the first people in this land that we call the United States of America or what some Native Americans call Turtle Island were African people, game over. Because you you the, the consciousness of African people will be transformed overnight. 
because we we're largely taught that we first came to this land conquered by Europeans shackled in chains. OK, when we learned that this was our land stolen from us, you're going to have a seismic shift in the consciousness and the establishment archaeologists and white supremacy in general can't let that happen. Go, yeah. go ahead and wrap up with your book. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, the, the thing I would add from a, from a, a research methods point of view is that to all of the articles, it's incumbent for the primary researcher to go to the original study mm -hmm. because when the articles come out, that alerts the public about a new discovery. But all of the, all of the articles, all of the articles that come out, they'll indicate the research team, who led the team and what, what uh, institution they're affiliated with, as well as where the original study is published. Right. So, so that's where it, it really is important to go to the original study and then examine the evidence because that's where the attacks take place. Not not necessarily the the newspaper or, or general journal article that comes up a newspaper article, but the actual study and does the evidence prove right what it attacking is the being, study yeah, attacking so, the study right yes so mm -hmm. so the study has to be examined and 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 when the study is examined either it holds up or it doesn't hold up but the articles are important because they alert us to the mm -hmm. study that's come out in a professional journal. And then we examine the evidence and honestly sometimes they hold up sometimes they don't so so uh, but the bottom line is the mainstream their position is none of it's going to hold up because it would upset and overturn their position so they're right. attacking the study because it is outside of the boundaries and the his and the historical time frame that they've already presented so you know right. what it is it's like this is that when you're looking at early American settlements or when American, I don't mean the U.S., but the early settlements in the Americas, it's mm -hmm. like a, a puzzle. And when you're finding pieces here and there, you get an idea of what you have. And people are familiar with a jigsaw puzzle. You don't need to have every piece to understand the puzzle. So right. what happens is that when there is so these people, the mainstream, the, the BS theorists, they want people to think that there's a shorter time period and people came from Asia first. But that's not what the evidence says. That's not correct at all. People were here much longer than that. So they're looking for anything that fits their theory. So when someone right. comes up with evidence far older than what is being claimed, then instead of saying, well, maybe, wait a minute, maybe we have the whole jigsaw puzzle as config configurated wrong because this, feet, this, this piece does not fit in at all. So rather mm -hmm. than saying, well, let's reconsider the layout of the puzzle because this is clearly a piece of the puzzle and it doesn't fit they don't do that they throw out the piece and right. try to find something to fit the fake and phony puzzle that they put together in the first place it's an a priori assumption it's a mm -hmm. prior assumption that doesn't fit the evidence and that's what that's what we deal with so that's why it's really incumbent of going but going to directly to the study to see because there's been some claims that have been challenged and probably rightfully so but there's a whole body of them that are absolutely credible that cannot be overturned that can't be credibly challenged but uh but the bearing straight there is somehow do challenge it and so that they can reach the conclusion that they know better and therefore let me keep my prominent lifestyle and my prominent name out there because uh we got there first and we know better than anybody else and that's pretty what pretty much what happened. So it's always amazing. Uh, and this is what I really train people in terms of the research methods is that we go directly to the source, we examine the evidence, because if you're doing primary research, you're doing original research, but you do have to rely on the work of others, but there has to be a critical assessment of it. And by the way, in, in the world of archeology, span or early African studies or American, early American studies, if somebody's claiming a discovery, and this is what I share in my book, the whole first like first section of the book is about research methods uh, right. in, in the introduction. It's got to be two things that have to be established. If someone claims that they made a discovery, it's two things, and I have this laid out uh, methodically in the book. Number one, you have to show uh, in situ photographs. In situ photographs means they're photographs in the situation in which you claim to have found the artifact or human remains. So you can't just take a 
artifact, for example, and, and say it's old, and then you clean it up, and then you put it against a, a wall for a nice background and claim and tell us that this is this came from this site. We don't know that. We weren't right. there. That's not good enough. You can't clean it up and then dust off all of the dirt and put it up. We, we want to see the photographs in which you claim to found it in that situation. It's called in situ photograph, a series of them. And 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 also there has to be uh, a detailed written report as well to explain right. all these details. And now with photography and video, that's another requirement. And without that, we don't trust what anybody is claiming as some major discovery because we don't know we weren't there. So there, so this is the standards in the scientific community. And so people will either present this in a scholarly journal their findings, or they will present it at a professional gathering of, of uh, experts in that particular field. Those are the two ways that you have it as a at a professional annual gathering, or you present it in a in a refereed or a scholarly journal, and then we make our assessment and our examination of the credibility of the evidence. And usually, there's an a priori assumption that it ain't credible because it's older than what we've ever discovered. And a matter of fact, you know what they told Professor Gino? You could not right. have discovered it because we didn't discover it. What kind of position? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a white supremacist position. That, that's that's what we're dealing with. Um, all right, let's go go ahead and uh, tell people once again the name of your book and how they can get it. Okay, I appreciate that. So my book is a history of African civilizations, and it grew out of my work at uh, Contra Costa College. It's a small part of what I teach there, but uh, it's a second revised edition. It's only twenty nine ninety five. It's uh, some of my field research in various countries over the last three decades, and um, it moves through the uh, survey of the civilizations on the African continent and also. Um, a little influence, a, a little focus on the influence of the Moors in Spain, as well as the African original presence and influence in the Americas before slavery, before Columbus, even before Christ. So the main thing is to really put African civilizations on the map and to talk about Africa without having to deal with slavery and colonialism and when Africa was derailed. The book is not focusing on that. That's a whole right. other story. We're focusing on Africa at the apex of human achievement. And so that's uh, that's my book. So and it's also uh, useful in the classroom or in uh, in the homeschool. If people are, are teaching at home or just want to learn at home and build your library, the book is, right. is uh, useful in, in all of those scenarios. His website is advancingtheresearch.org, advancingtheresearch.org. Get Professor Manu M. Pim's latest book, A History of African Civilizations. This is the second revised edition. Also, Brother uh, Haki had the question, uh, uh, do you have any tours coming up? I do, and thanks for the question. So this summer, I'm going to take uh, two, two groups. It'll be a, a, a tour to Kemet or Egypt from June 8th through the 22nd, 15 days. And then after that, I'm leading an educational tour to, to Ethiopia or the land of Kush from June 25th through July 10th, that's 16 days. And um, just so people are aware that for the tours that I lead, I take people to 25% more sites and monuments than any other tour. It doesn't mean the other tours don't have value, but we go to more 25% more locations. So the tours, you can reach me um, probably the easiest way is uh, through Facebook, YouTube, or just at mainnewampim at gmail, mainnewampim okay. at gmail. And then you can learn about the tours because the deadlines are coming up in, uh, in April. So there's right. still room for both Kemet and Ethiopia, but the deadlines are, are, are coming up. Kemet? <laughs> and then Ethiopia. Can people contact you through your website, advancingtheresearch.org? Yes, they can. Yeah, they can contact us. Click right on there. contact and uh, uh, click on contact us. Contact, yeah. uh, contact the, us. And it, at the and top they can of the page. Just, yeah, at the top of the page. They can just email at info, okay. info at advancingtheresearch.org as well. Okay. And we, we have one another, yeah, next weekend we'll have one other last session about the educational uh, tours to Kemet and Ethiopia. And I'm excited because we're going to bring a great group this summer 
And then after the tours, I'm going to continue my work in the Omo Valley in uh, South Sudan this summer. But uh, please join us, folks. And I'll say one thing. Sometimes people yes. say, well, sometimes they'll say, well, do you go every year? No such thing as every year because you never know. Like, for example, COVID right. disrupted travel and so did the Egyptian uh, revolution or what right. they call the Arab Spring in 2011. It disrupted. So twice in a decade, we had situations where no one can travel to the area. So you never really know. But right. we're going this year. So check it out and um, and uh, come learn. Yeah, come exactly. learn and have a good time. So yeah, I, I appreciate it, brother. I mean, this is no African problem. History, uh, African, African History Network. That's what. Yes. <laughs> that, yep. that's, that's what that's we what do. That, that's exactly. That's what we do. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, look, you have a good day, Professor Manu and Pim. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on today. Everybody, stay on for one more minute. Got a special message for you. Uh, so we'll talk to you soon, okay, brother? And 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 and, and buy his book, please, and go on his tour. All right, brother, brother, Michael. Okay, brother. All right. Peace. Hotel. Peace. Hotel. Peace. All right, everybody. That is Professor Manu and Pim. Um, be sure to follow us here on our uh, Facebook fan page, The African History Network, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Follow us on our social media platforms as well uh, on Twitter and uh, Instagram. We have the information here on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can also register for the 10 week online history course that I teach, where we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. This is a class that uh, I created and created the curriculum. I've been teaching it since uh, 2017 on and off ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So the class is discounted to uh, $60. We're gonna do uh, about 12 class sessions, in including the, um, the first session, which was an overview, we have the uh, class lesson plan here for uh, all uh, 10 or 11 class sessions as well. So you can see the type of content that we cover. Uh, you can download the you can download the class lesson plans here, here as well. So we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We look at some ancient African civilizations, not just ancient Kemet, but also uh, Kush, um, Ethiopia. We look at Great Zimbabwe, uh, we look at uh, Hannibal Barca and uh, Carthage. We talk about the African Moors as well. Uh, we have a preview of the class here uh, also. So you can uh, register for it. Click right here to register for the class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch it anytime. So a year from now, two years from now, uh, you have full access. You can go back and watch the entire course, okay? Our next classes are Saturday, April 6th. Saturday, April 13th, April 20th, April 27th, um, 2024. And we do the classes usually 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We, we may have one last class session after uh, April 27th. We have to see how, how much uh, we can cover, okay? But as soon as you register, you can start watching the content. And uh, we're going to post the link right here so you can start watching it right now uh, as soon as you register for the class. The content is PG-13, um, so you can use this with your children. There are 80 to 100 articles that we reference in the class. Uh, there's like 15 books. You don't have to buy any books to follow along in class. And we talk about this here in the uh, lesson plan. OK, we can't start studying our history and slavery. Even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important, we can't start in 1619 or the 1440s uh, when the Portuguese get involved. We have to deal with it. Um, hundreds of years, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Also deal with some of the history of the Khoisan who go all around the world. Uh, there are 200 slides, over 200 slides that I put together uh, in a PowerPoint presentation that we'll look at. There are 80 to 100 articles that will reference. So I picked out the articles. There are 15 uh, books that we reference. Uh, so we show you excerpts of the book on the screen. You don't have to buy any of the books if you don't want to. They're good for your library uh, if you want to. Also, we'll look at excerpts of interviews that I've done with some of our scholars, like Professor James Small, Professor Kabahai Wapi Kamane, uh, Anthony Browder, uh, Tony Browder, who wrote Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization and Egypt on the Potomac. We use um, uh, those two books, those are two of the books we use in the class. Uh, also, we'll look at excerpts of interviews that I've done with Renoka Rashidi and some other scholars uh, also. OK, so we do the sessions live. All the sessions are ordered. You can go back and watch it anytime. 
all right? That's ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. If you uh, want to support the African History Network, another way you can do so through, uh, now this is the, um, this is the show I did deconstructing Candace Owens, uh, the lies she was telling on The Breakfast Club. This is part one of the fact check. This was two and a half hours, and we got into some deep history. I provided sources dispelling a lot of the nonsense she was talking about. Part two, uh, we're going to do that on Sunday, April 7th. Uh, it'll be 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on the African History Network show because we're going to get into the lies that she was talking, uh, uh, telling, uh, saying that Donald Trump is is uh, would be better for America. Donald Trump is better for black people, things like this. We can go go through and, and uh, point by point dispel all that nonsense she was talking about. Listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook and YouTube. We're uh, listen to the podcast also. It's a podcast from search for the African History Network show or click right here, the link for podcast. Then uh, we have our uh, cash app and PayPal information here. Dollar sign the AHN show through cash app. Dollar sign the AHN show through cash app. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay some of the bills, uh, finance the research, finance the, the, the broadcast, et cetera pay for these services that I have to use to um, do these broadcasts and run the African History Network. This is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to the, say, Michael, these other ones here, and it's like five fake African History Network Cash App accounts I've identified that they're stealing money from us. You can click here on our link. It shows our QR code. So um, this is our Cash App account, and we have the link for PayPal as well, okay? And uh, lastly, uh, we have a bundle pack where you get uh, uh, 15 of my lectures in digital download format. That is um, African History Awakens the African Mind for Mental Death. African History Awakens the African Mind for Mental Death. We have it in digital download format so you can download the videos and keep them. Uh, this is at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, this is on sale, half off is on sale $75. It's 15 of my lectures, including my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther and dealing with the African cultural influences uh, in Black Panther and how the film Black Panther relates to African history, culture, language, spiritual systems. We have lectures dealing with um, that I've done uh, dealing with Malcolm X, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., six, principle, six principles of political self-defense, because I'm also a national political commentator. A lot of people see me every Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I've been on Roland's show pretty much every Friday since October 2020. So I'm not just a historian. I'm a national pol political commentator, radio show host, uh, lecturer, et cetera, researcher. Uh, I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. My degree is in business administration from Wayne State University. So there's a lecture that I did, 13 Forms of Wealth Keys to Entrepreneurship and Economic Empowerment. Um, Ancient Kemet, The Winter Solstice and the History of Christmas. This is a double lecture that I did with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Uh, so we did this, th this double lecture here in uh, Detroit a few years ago. Redistributing the Pain, How African-Americans Fought Back with Economic Boycotts. Uh, the Light of Ancient Egypt Awakens the African Mind to Economic Empowerment. Ancient Africans in America Before Native Americans Columbus or Slavery. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. That's a four-hour lecture uh, that I did. Great African History, the Mothers of Civilization. And then we have um, uh, a Black Panther analysis uh, for children. I, I was speaking to uh, about 60 uh, African-American children and their teachers. Uh, these were fifth through 12th graders, okay? We did this here at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History. Then also African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences, okay? So, and then you'll get the the uh, the presentation I did dealing with uh, Black Panther, uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I did that in November, 2022. So you actually get 16 lectures, okay? So African-American history awakens the African mind uh, from uh, mental death. That's a bundle pack. If you want it on DVD, uh, it's a hundred dollars. If you want that bundle pack in uh, DVD format. All right. Okay. So we're going to get out of here. Uh, remember at the, Oh, let me uh, post this here. So we have the, 
uh, Cash App, PayPal information also. Hopefully you learned a lot today. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. You can go back and uh, rewatch this uh, as well. And uh, watch the uh, show that I did with Candace Owens. Also, we have the broadcast that I did dealing with um, the history of Easter, uh, Easter origins, pagan traditions, um, and then of African Americans and, and Exodus. You can watch that uh, also that's uh, streaming on our social media platforms as well, Facebook and YouTube, okay? Uh, we have the Cash App, PayPal information here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next.